He is worthy. He is worthy. And that one section of He is worthy where it says, uh, there'll be no darkness where the light can't come through. <laughs> I like that phrase. Hey, do that last one, Mary, won't you? That's all right. We'll sing it for that again. Go, go. We'll sing her to show to the nation. Planted this afternoon, Lord, I pray that you continue to work in the hearts of uh, the people in this city. Uh, Lord, there's been a lot of gospel seeds spread in this city. Lord, we pray that you would reap a mighty harvest and uh, bring many more souls to your kingdom. Have them become a part of the work that you're doing here. Um, Lord, I thank you for this conference. We have the privilege to be a part of here. Uh, Lord, thank you for all that have come this evening. Lord, would you stir all of our hearts tonight um, and just give us more the Savior's heart for souls. Um, Lord, just give us a passion for the lost uh, and continue to uh, draw our hearts closer to what your heart is like. And we pray that Jesus will be lifted up in tonight's service. We pray in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this missionary conference that we have planned and prayed about for many months now. And we pray that it is honoring to our Savior as we lift him up on high that what we do, what we say, might glorify him. Father, we pray that you will speak to our hearts, open our hearts and our minds to be receptive to your word that is brought forth tonight. Father, we just thank you for these four families, five if we count the other couple on Sunday night, that you have chosen to speak to their hearts, to go to lands to us in the foreign lands and lands that many of us would not like to go to, but they have given their lives, Father, to serve you in these lands, to start churches, to win souls and bring people to you. Father, we just thank you for them. We pray for their safety each day, their accommodations at night, and be with them, Father, that their needs might be met. And Father, we just want to give you all the praise and the honor. We pray in our precious Savior's name. Amen. 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 Father, Lord, as we seek you, Lord, and as we seek to do your will, may our hearts be right before you, Lord. Please cleanse us this evening, Lord that we may be right before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, somebody
Somebody got a favorite hymn they want to do? Yes, Julia. Um, hymn 492 at Calvary. At Calvary. Hymn 492 at Calvary. We'll sing that one a while. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh, let's do that one anyway. Let's do the day the Lord has made, and then we'll do a video of him, okay? <laughs> This is a day, this is a day that the Lord has made. The value of one is a great one. Let's do that together. The value of one. Let's do that one. I am so grateful to see such a good, healthy crowd again tonight. So early. I praise the Lord for that. That's good. a visitor, stay right where you're at. Anybody else? I didn't see any other visitors coming in just yet. But listen, those of you who were here last night and you were in A, you go to B. Alright? So B is in the back over here, okay? If you were a B, then you go to C. Alright? C is the West Wing Social Hall. If you were a C, then you go to D, which is all the way over in the other side of the Social Hall. And if you were a D, then you come to A, all right? Come to A, right here, all right? All right, go ahead. Missionaries, you stay in the same place. Missionaries, stay in the same place, okay? Good to see you. Hey, Tom, you're perfect right there. Perfect right back there. Tom, you need to stay in that back area right there. Get that fish, 
Yeah, you sure can. There you go, bro. <coughs> All right. Good evening. Good evening. We are the Venus, and we are going to the Philippines. Uh, those of you that don't know, uh, Philippines is in uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, just um, just east of Vietnam, and Cambodia, and south of Taiwan, and uh, that's where it's at right there. And there's uh, it's one of the largest growing countries in all of Southeast Asia. There's over uh, 110 million people, and it's a very densely populated island in the Philippines. We have over 7,000 islands, and so just in the city of uh, Manila, there's over 1 million homeless children. Oh my God! I mean, there is a need there like I've never seen before. Wow! And the first time I went there, I was in shock. I can't believe there's children homeless, and uh, couldn't couldn't get over all that God was doing there. Though people are very open to the gospel. Um, we were able to, we were, last time we were in the Philippines was 2018, and we were able to go into some public schools. Some of you saw our video, but that's going to be a big part of our ministry. Uh, most of the population in the Philippines is under 30 years old, so there's a very, very large uh, population of children, and so that'll be a big part of our ministry. And uh, we're able to get into public schools. In the Philippines, it's all about who you know, and uh, one of the local pastors knew the principal to one of the schools, and we made that connection, and the principal let us go into the school. He said, you have an hour to say whatever you want. Amen. And the floor is yours. So we went up there, and we, we sang, and we gave the, the gospel. Many people came forward to be saved. I thought it was in a dream or something like that, but you don't <laughs> listen like this. We can't go to public schools. This is not allowed. Right. Uh, but in the Philippines, it that is. is. It's just, a, just an open door, oh. and we're excited about what God is doing there. The Philippines, of course, 7,000 islands. The main island that most people know about is Luzon, and that is where uh, Manila is in the first year. Uh, we'll be in uh, Metro Manila there if you go to a language school. But at the same time, we'll be working with uh, senior missionary, uh, Brother Chris Hurst in the Antipola, uh, BIMI missionary there. And uh, during that first year, we'll be going to, there's another island. If you look out front on our map, we have put some stars on some of the different islands. And the island that we're uh, praying about right now is the island of Mindoro. Mm -hmm. Mindoro is uh, a little bit smaller than the state of Connecticut, and there's one and a half million people on that island. There is uh, an indigenous group there uh, that we're really, really praying hard about. Uh, they're called the Mangyans. If you look even on YouTube, you'll see documentaries about these people. They live in the mountains. They live in the jungles of this island of Mindoro. And uh, they live very primitively. They don't have electricity, they don't have running water, nothing like that. And in the Philippines, they have kind of a class system where there is the very rich and then the poor. And there's not really much of a middle class. And uh, the, the upper class, they kind of look down on uh, the poor and especially these indigenous groups. Uh, I've heard it quoted before that some Filipinos think of them as not much better than animals. And that's, that's just the way it is. So, um, they're a little bit resistant, the Westerners coming in, uh, at least this indigenous group, uh, they don't want, they're proud of their culture, and uh, they don't want to be bothered, uh, but we talked with other senior missionaries, you know, you go in there, and you, you befriend them, you find the chief of the village, and you just start that relationship, and that's mm -hmm. what we're going to do, and we want to go to that island and try to reach out to these people, um, but it's, uh, it's a blessing. They, uh, the Philippines, there's eight major dialects. And uh, so my wife is Filipina. She was born in the States, but her parents immigrated to the States in the late 80s. And uh, she grew up in a Filipino home. So she's very acquainted with the culture. She knows what is acceptable and what is not. And she also knows the language. So that does help. And um, they see another Filipino. Sometimes that opens the door. Um, they're not as resistant. So uh, the, the Mangyans, they speak Tagalog. They don't, they don't speak English there, really. So um, it would be very important for us to get the language down, but uh, we're excited about going. Uh, Lord willing, uh, next 
fall, July, August, something like that, depending on how fast the sport comes in. So that dedication's been going really well, though. Um, we've been at it going about 13, 13 months right now. We're at about 65, 67%, so it's going very well. So we'll go about the end of the year, maybe 75% to that uh, next summer. Yes, ma'am. How far is Manila? How far is Manila? From right here, I would say it's eight to nine, uh, 8,500 miles away from here. I would say. And so the, the flight to get there is uh, it's long. It's 20 hours and uh, total a total hour. And so we're out of Michigan, so we would have probably fly yeah straight to Japan and then to the north. That's not it. Will you be? I may have not been listening. Did, will you be going to other islands? Yes. Yes. Well, we're. we're we're, we're going to be church planting, and uh, the first island we're looking at is Mindoro. That's that big island. There's a smaller island, if you look at our map out front. Uh, the island so of would you need a boat for that, or do they just give you ferry yeah. service? Or yeah, logistics is a little bit different in the Philippines. We've, we've talked about getting a boat, yes. Uh -huh. um, but for now... Not the boat. Not in the same boat sense as you would think here. Yeah. It's basically, it's basically bamboo with a boat. Oh, right. <laughs> you know. And we've um we've flown to a lot of those islands already before. Um, and the thing is, when when I was going in the eighth grade, those um those air trips were actually still dirt roads. But now they're at least paved. But you have to leave Manila at a certain time because it's it, there's no electricity on those runways. Yeah. So um, if you don't leave Manila in time um, and the sun isn't there enough to light the runway, then you're get, you, they're going to deplane you and then you have to wait the next day to get a flight. Do most, do most Filipinos speak with the facility that you speak English? Um, no? No, but the, one, the ones in Metro Detroit, or Metro, Metro Detroit, that's where we're from, Metro Manila are very, um, are very knowledgeable in English. They learn English from the school. All of their textbooks are in English except for the Filipino class. So they grow up learning. If, if they grew up in school and they didn't leave school or anything like that, then they do know English rather well. A lot of the call centers, if you'll notice, have moved from India to the Philippines now. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Because Why? Because the accent's yes. easier to understand? Yes. Yeah. Yes, very much so. What do you think mm -hmm. of that? Um, it's it's a lot of things. It's not just one specific thing. Um, 
a lot of children do get traffic from the provinces to um, Metro Manila, where they're forced to work to make a living. Um, also, um, with this, this is not a bad thing. This is a great thing about um, um, abortion is illegal in, in wow. the Philippines. Wow. So, which is a good thing, but when the parents end up abandoning their children, it becomes uh, a very big issue there. So, um, a lot of missionaries, especially who um, end up staying in Metro Manila, um, end up having um, an orphanage attached to their ministry just because of the high volume of children that are either just dropped off at their door or come. Is that something you guys are planning on doing? Um, we're, I mean, we're definitely open to it. We're not going to say no to anyone that comes to our door, you know. It'll be uh, definitely a ministry to our church. We anticipate having a huge children's ministry, especially with, um, when we're in Metro Manila. But um, in Mindoro, um, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit different. It's very much more provincial. Um, a lot of farmers, a lot of fishermen. Um, so the family dynamic in Mindoro is, is better than in what it is in Metro Manila. Concerning. That really is. It breaks yeah. my heart to hear. Yeah. What kind of work do you do in the Philippines? What kind of work do I? Well, um, we, <laughs> well, we, we, we work secular jobs. I'm going to talk about that in the message tonight a little bit, too, kind of our background. But we're going there to be church planters. We believe that's what God would have us to do. Right. So we're not going to be doing anything else. Everything we do is church planting and then outreach from the church, basically. Do you think you'll use your nursing? You probably will, won't you? So um, I am a nurse practitioner, and I specialize in nephrology by trade. Um, the nurse practitioner license does not transfer over to the Philippines because there's no nurse practitioner role. I'm sorry for my ignorance. What is nephrology? Nephrology is the study of your kidneys. The kid oh, then you yes. said that yesterday. Okay, yes, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so, but my nursing license will transfer, just not my nurse practitioner license. So I will still keep my nurse, my nursing license active because um, we got really good counseling from our missions organization saying that sometimes the only reason why other countries will let you stay and continue in your ministry in that country is because of the services you can provide. So I will not be directly working as a nurse there for profit or for money or as a job per se, but um, I will still use my knowledge as a ministry basically. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. What's your, your life verse? Just wanted to, just want to see. Yeah, it's kind of in our family verse. Um, Psalm 37, 4, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. That's the verse that really helped us in our calling to go to the Philippines. God used that just to solidify. Uh, when we had questions, God, is this really what you want us to do? And uh, yeah, we preached on it today, actually. Yeah, and I would say prayer request for us. Uh, we're working on getting dual citizenship. So in order to get into the Philippines right now, it's pretty locked down, as you've seen in the news. Uh, but we're going to, uh, because she, her parents were born in the Philippines, she has the right to become a citizen. And then that, that will help us to get back in. Um, <clears throat> what really got my attention was when you said that you can go into the schools 
and give the gospel. Amen. I was thinking, if we could only do that in this country. Right. Yeah. It's, it's so sad that, that they took God out of our schools. Yeah. Remember, when I was growing up, we could say the Lord's Prayer in school. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been going since eighth grade, and what's really, really awesome is sometimes you don't see the fruits of your labor until years and years and years right. down the road. But because we've been going for you know every two years, I sometimes we go back to the same school. So I'll see some kids uh, in Bible college. So if we'll if we visit one of the Bible colleges there, they'll come up and tell me, listen, I was I saw you in two thousand four or whatever, and you helped like help guide me to go to Bible college Praise and Amen. that is that is so awesome too, because when we started in the public school and then now we see them in Bible college which is such a blessing yeah. and, and then even to even more we'll, we host pastors banquets when we're there too and then we'll see them years later say look at my family and we're serving God and we have a church here and it's, it's very it's very very receptive so very receptive and we're thankful that we get to go into the public schools and we don't just go to the public school, present the gospel, and leave. We always bring local pastors in that area with us so that they have some church, a local church that they can go to after we're gone. So there's follow-up and discipleship. And Any other questions? What did we meet? Yeah. In 2005. I'm gonna, yeah, 2005 in college. We met at Pensacola Christian College. Nice. What, uh, what's your favorite dish? What do you like in the Philippines? Um, 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 Yeah, we'll get all the folks singing in here. Here we go. All right. 
I'd like to do our uh, theme uh, song Amen. for the conference, and we're going to do that right after I pray, but look around for a second. Look around. Hey. Tuesday night. Look at this. Hey. Isn't that cra crazy? Isn't that crazy? I just yeah. praise the Lord. Uh, certainly blew last year out of the water and continues by God's grace to allow us to grow and grow the church. Last night, 95 joined us. Yeah. For a good day. Good night. What the world. I know people have to work and folks are out because of that. I'm sure that some are even working now. But think of that. Isn't that marvelous? We're praying together. Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for the 143 Sunday night. Thank you for the over 200 Sunday. Thank you for the 95 last night. Thank you for the 190 visitors Friday night. Lord, numbers don't matter, but people do. And people are numbers. And we glorify you for that. I praise you for the people. And I ask you, Father, to save souls and continue to move and work. Thank you, dear Lord God, for saving this young man today on his doorstep and Susan and others. I, I praise you especially. I can't help it. I praise you especially for Lydia. <laughs> she just thrills my heart. Lord, as we sing this awesome song, considering the sin-sick soul, help us, Father, to really enjoy it. In Jesus' name, amen.
several that have already done it and that's fine too. Father, use our money. Lord, take it. Just take it. Translate it into something eternal. Well, thank you, Jesus.
singing tonight, but amen, we're going to do some more. Let's yeah. stand. Yeah. If you want your hymn book, it's 444. I know it's on the screen behind me. I love to tell the story. We're going to sing the first thing and the last thing.
and as we sing, a world will never try. The altars are open. If you need to make use of the altars, just come and pray and ask the Lord to make you a witness. He walked along the shores of Galilee. From I looked over at my buddy and I said, hey, 
let's go up. He said, no. I went. I wasn't okay. going to stay in the seat. And I know for sure I trusted Christ as my Savior. Okay. Yeah. So my wife also, at a young age, I was seven, she was eight. It was a uh, Bible club, Good News Bible Club, in her living room. Amen. After the Good News Bible Club, she went to her mom and, and uh, said, I need to get saved. So her mom was able to lead us to the Lord, and that's a good blessing there. But uh, both of us also, as time went on, grew up in church, good churches, and um, we surrendered our lives to whatever the Lord wanted at the age of 11 for my wife. And not sure what age first I was, but at age 13, uh, the Lord worked in my heart for missions specifically. And I said, Lord, I'll, I'll be a missionary anyway. So when I met my wife at college, uh, first date, we're talking about Canada. Because I knew a little bit of French, I thought. Uh, so we, we went to Quebec, actually, on our anniversary. And we're waiting for God to move us to, to Quebec, Canada. I'm speaking Quebec. And um, he didn't do it. So, and so um, we were called back to work in the church up there in Newcastle. We were there for four more years, five years, four years, four years. And um, and then the Lord said, it's time to go. In a missions conference, just like this. And God is God. And um, we knew it was time. The church knew it was time. The people, when they came up and shook our hands at the end of the Sunday night service, said, we knew you were going to be missionaries, and we knew you were going to Tanzania. <laughs> Hey Jake, let me ask you something. How long is that video? Uh, I'm only going to talk for 20 seconds. Yeah. How long is the video? Just under 10 minutes. Is it 10? Oh, good night. Nice. Okay. Hey, brother Midkit, come on up here real quick. We'll do this first. Come here real quick, uh, brother Jake. We'll get to your video, all right? All right. Just a minute. But brother Midkit, this is for your solar HD projector. Look at this, man. This is really cool. I didn't even know you could do This is solar power, this thing. A video projector. Now tell me if that's not cool, man. That's pretty neat. Universal travel adapter, European wall charger, Bluetooth keyboard, hair accessory kit. Hair accessory kit. Oh, not for you. Okay, for the girls. Is it for the girls? Yeah, okay. And then $30 Chick-fil-A just to top off the 650 bucks. There you go right there. Get my hand, everybody. What a joke. Come on. Come on up here, man. Go take this through that video, and we'll get the kids out, and they can have their revival time. Oh, yeah. Here. <laughs> my name is Jake Allen. Hello, everyone. We have two children, Abigail Grace and Mark Gideon, missionaries to the country of Hungary. Um, I will just play our deputation video for you. It tells you a little bit about Hungary and also shows uh, some highlights from our survey trip we were just able to go on this past summer. Okay, thank you, brother. That was great. Among the many places of the world, the country of Hungary is in great need of volunteers. Founded over a thousand years ago, Hungary is a land of rich history. The country is known for its musical compositions and for inventions of familiar things such as ballpoint pens, binoculars, and a Rubik's Cube. Hungary was at one time a very large kingdom, but now it's landlocked in Central Europe following the devastation of World War II. After that war, Hungary was under the rule of communism, and their economy suffered greatly. Since the fall of the Soviet Union in the early 90s, Hungary has established itself as an independent republic within the European Union. Out of approximately 10 million people, Around 37% of Hungarians claim to be Catholic, and over 45% claim to be either atheist, agnostic, or unaffiliated with any religion. Estimate the sum of born-again believers would be far under 1%. The country is the 8th highest in alcoholism and holds the 12th highest suicide rate in the world. The Hungarian people need Jesus and his message of salvation. It is to this needy and white harvest that God has called Jake and Ramona Allen. My name is Gideon Ola, National Missionary to Hungary. Our children was a great help in our church family ministry, and we praise God how he provided good Bible schools for our two older children, Ramona and David. God provided a husband for Ramona also three years ago. We were praying for more missionaries for Hungary. It's a great joy to see how the Lord working in Jake and Ramona's heart as they want to come to serve the Lord in Hungary. Please pray for them and support them as they able to come our mission fields. 
Thank you. God bless you. Doug called the Allies to be missionaries in Hungary as a direct answer to prayer. Ramona and I were baptized on the same day more than 20 years ago, and we grew up serving the Lord together in the church in Page, where her parents were missionaries. A few years ago, God called our family to plant a new church in the third district of Budapest. Seeing the great need for more laborers in our country of more than 10 million people, and only a handful of independent Baptist churches, we are looking forward to ministering with them during their first few years as Jake Master of the Language. Please join us in praying for the Allen Company. We really enjoyed our survey trip to the country of Hungary this summer. We had an excellent time there. God really used the trip in our lives. The family camp is really a fun time. Five of the eight independent Baptist churches in Hungary met together for fellowship, food, and preaching. It was really an excellent time. We're happy we were able to be there. Another highlight was the youth conference. This is really a great group of young people that have a lot of potential for the Lord. We had a lot of fun together. We were able to preach to them several different times. I am really happy to have had this experience. Dr. Zoli and Johanna Kish organized the youth conference and he translated for me as I preached as well. We had one day where we spent some time part of the woods doing some different activities. Really had a good time. Please pray that God will use these young people to reach their own people in the country of Hungary. We had a lot of really unique opportunities. I was able to preach around 20 times while I was there in the country. We were able to go soul winning in three different cities while we were there. Uh, four people trusted Christ during the time that we were in Hungary. I was the silent partner to one encounter, and the other three were other Hungarians leading people to the Lord themselves. Very exciting. Ramona was able to share the gospel and her testimony with people in Hungarian. I was also able to uh, share the gospel with people in English and also to Hungarians through a translator. We were encouraged to see how many people were open to having conversations about the gospel. Someone just needs to go and share it with them. During one of our days out, we spent most of the day just touring the city to get to go up on top of St. Stephen's Basilica. Just breathtaking view of the city of Budapest and thinking of the 1.7 million people represented just in this city. St. Stephen's Basilica has a panoramic view. You can look all the way around the city and there's just apartment buildings and places as far as you can see. Over 1 million souls who need to hear about Jesus. As I was listening to the song, It Is Well With My Soul, being sung in Hungarian, it struck me on this last verse. It says, And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. You know, that's great for us who are Christians, but there is a lost world out there it needs Jesus. 
You know, the only reason that Jesus hasn't come back yet is because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We can and should be thankful that Jesus is saving our souls and is well with our souls. But there is a lost world out there, millions of Hungarian people, who made us not well with their soul. Marty Square. There are just countless people everywhere that you go. I was just so stirred by how many people there are. And as I was seeing these people, spending time praying for them, asking God, how can we reach them? I was reminded of the verse, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. We're not going to be able to scratch the surface of what needs to get done in Hungary on our own. We need more people to join in share the gospel with these needy people. And hunger is just one country among many that need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please pray for the country of Hungary. And pray that our family can get there to do the work that God has called us to as quickly as possible. God bless you. Amen. Hey, Jerry, I think we'll sing our song tomorrow night. Uh, Brother Beeman, before you come up, let me just say one thing. Did you notice how similar the kids and the adults, everybody are to you? Do you know that that's how it is everywhere in the world? You understand something? Satan is orchestrating this world. He's orchestrating the dress. He's orchestrating this massive push in the LGBTQ community. Do you know that the LGBTQ community has gotten to a point where they are pushing that stuff down people's throats? They know 90% of us hate it, and yet they have control of the airwaves. Why? Satan is the prince and the power of the air, and he wants to destroy us. Now, that think about that. This is a greater need than ever to have missionaries over here. Do you understand that? Amen. Now, we can have a part in that. How many people are in Seaford? Do you know? About 5,000. 8,000. I, I was told that today. Is that about right, Earl? Yeah. 8,000 is what I was told today. Listen. 1,775,000 people in that area that we were just looking at. So how can I have an influence over almost 2 million people? Do you know how? Pray. Give, and if the Lord calls our sons and daughters or even ourselves, let's go. Hey, hey that's right. let's have a team to the children go and get a good dose of this right now so that they may be called to the mission field. You and I called to the mission field through Brother Beeman's message. Brother Beeman, come real quick. Take the pulpit if you want to grab this thing. And let's go. <laughs>
You know, we hear a lot of horror stories from missionaries on deputation. I heard one missionary tell me one time, Tom, the uh, deputation is, is just another form of purgatory. Isn't that felt that way, though? It's been a blessing. Uh, every time I come into a uh, missions conference, a new church, new faces, I get asked two questions just about every single time. Uh, the first question is, of course, what mission field are you going to? I tell them the Philippines. The second most common question I get is, how old are you? And, uh, just to satisfy your curiosity, I am 34 years old, and I'm not, I'm not 92 yet. Uh, uh, believe it or not, I'm only nine months older than uh, my wife. Um, a lot of times we come into a place and they think, oh, we have our three girls, and then they look at my wife and they think that's just my oldest daughter. So, <laughs> no, no. better in college, first day of class, uh, 2005, Pensacola Christian College. The teacher made a comment, he said, you might be sitting next to someone that you'll marry one day. And uh, that turned out to be true for us. <laughs> Her last name started with A, mine was uh, B. And at that time, I didn't even know what the Philippines was, I'll be honest. My geography wasn't too good. I just knew this girl was beautiful, and I want to talk to her. But uh, I was just shy and backwards with girls just because I just didn't have that ability. Uh, but God worked that out, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but God is just changed our world, flipped it upside down this past year. I mean, we are, um, never thought I'd be on deputation, I'll be honest. Um, grew up in a Christian home, I was saved when I was nine years old. When I was 14 years old, I surrendered my life to the Lord. I said, God, I, whatever you want me to do, I'll do that. And I didn't feel a particular calling to missions at that time. Uh, I feel like my wife and I, we haven't taken the traditional path to, to foreign missions, but um, we went to school uh, at PCC. My wife went to school for nursing. And then after that, she graduated and uh, she went on to get her master's degree and uh, became a nurse practitioner in nephrology. So if any of you have questions about your kidney health after service, she can help you. <laughs> she can do a consultation. Uh, but my wife is very, very intelligent. And um, the doctor looked at her sideways when she said she was retiring. What are you doing? You're, we need you here. She's very well respected. Uh, amongst uh, the clinics and the uh, hospitals there in Michigan, and for her to leave, that's all, it just didn't make sense to them. Um, but God has uh, changed our desire. Yeah. I'm going to talk about um, our life verse, a verse that um, has given great comfort to our family. Um, I, I was struggling with this calling our family was, um, God, how do you know that you want us to go to the mission field? Um, you look back in the Old Testament, you have people like Moses. I studied some of these men. How did Moses know that God wanted him to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? How did he know that? Well, God came to him in a burning bush. And I can tell you about a year ago, I could have used that same burning bush. And, uh, but we didn't get that. Uh, but God speaks to us through the word. And God gave us a verse that has really helped us to solidify that calling. And it's a verse that I think we can all... Uh, Use is a promise from God's word, and it's true, and it's something that our family is uh, living by now. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 37. You know, Psalm chapter 37. Um, I, I do want to look at one other passage uh, before we get to that, and that's in uh, Romans, Romans chapter 10. And can I just also say thank you so much for uh, the, all the accommodations, Pastor, we felt. Uh, so welcome and love here, and uh, thank you so much. I used to think growing up, seeing missionaries come through, man, I just feel sorry for those people. They're just going to miss out in life, and they're not going to get to do all these things now. What a great sacrifice they're going to make. Uh, but I can tell you, a missionary's life is not diminished in any way. Uh, we are so happy to be doing what God wants us to do, and uh, we've never been happier. And uh, God wants to use all of us. I'm going to look at Romans chapter 10. And uh, let me pray, and then we'll get started here. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for just being so good to us. Thank you for this church and these faithful people and their love for missions. God, I just pray that you'd use this time, Lord. Speak to all of our hearts, God. Change us and, and use us for your honor and glory. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 10, uh, start reading verse number 13. Uh, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how, um, 
Shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So here we have a, a, a passage that we use a lot in soul winning. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In the next verse, uh, we're introduced to a series of questions here. And the interesting thing about these questions, uh, you don't see an answer uh, given right in the scripture. And it's done that way uh, because the answer is very obvious. Let's look at verse number 14. Let's look at the end. Um, and let's look at uh, the very end of verse number 14. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Well, the answer is not there, but the answer is very obvious. They can't hear without a preacher. Right. That's why we have missionaries. That's right. why we send missionaries all throughout the world. Amen. And so the answer is obvious. And let's continue into verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? Again, there's no, there's no answer here, uh, but how can, they, how can they preach except they be sent? That's why we have local churches all around this country sending missionaries. Amen. Um, of course, the gospel needs to be preached. They can't hear without a preacher. We can't go to the Philippines unless, people can't hear in the Philippines unless a preacher goes and preaches the gospel. But the preacher can't go unless they're sent. When we come to a missions conference, we get thanked and patted on the back. But I just want to say thank you for being faithful to send missionaries. Mm -hmm. We can't go unless we're sent. So thank you for being faithful to give. And uh, we have to do this together, verse 14 and 15. Eh? You have to have both parts. You know? And uh, God is, uh, it's an honor to be called to go to the mission field. It really is. Um, and we don't take that lightly. That calling, it, it's, it's heavy on us. We want to do exactly what God wants us to do. And uh, we started in 2009. We, uh, we got married after college, and we started going on these mission trips to the Philippines. My wife is Filipina. She was born in the States just after her parents immigrated. And so she grew up in a Filipino home, and she went to school in the Philippines when she was little. And she started going on mission trips in the eighth grade. Well, after we got married, uh, she introduced me, hey, let, let's start going to mission trips uh, to the Philippines. I, I went to school for computer science and software engineering, and I, I, I really wanted to um, do my best for the Lord. I believe that's what God had called me into. And so after, after college, I got into an IT job for Dell. Uh, Dell EMC, many of you know who they are, and I became a storage engineer, software engineer, and um, we, we started doing well. I like to tell pastors, my wife and I, we kind of lived the American dream. Um, even before we were 30 years old, we had all the things that we wanted. We had gone through multiple houses, and you know what? We, these things, though, they, we kept wanting more and more and more. Uh, we got into one house, we had a custom house built, and of course, there, there's nothing wrong with that. The Lord allows you to do that, but we, it was just like these desires could never be fully satisfied. Right. We started to work right. our way up the right. corporate yeah. ladder of success, yeah. and we got around some the doctors and the CEOs, and you know, we went to their houses for Christmas parties and things, and their houses were even bigger than ours. <laughs> and we thought, you know, let's just get a bigger house, and we did. And we, we went out, and we got a house on a lake, uh, 5,600 square feet, uh, set five bathrooms, and everything was silly. Um, but these desires, we could never fully meet them. And we wanted to be faithful at church, and we were in Rock of Ages prison ministry and, and nursing homes and things. But, you know, all these things were just weighing on us. Let me ask you a question. Where are your desires at tonight? Uh -huh. oh, are good. your desires ordered by the Lord? Amen. That's what I want to talk about in the time we have. Are your desires ordered by the Lord? Uh, Psalm 37, 23 says this, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. You know what? The devil, I, I found, can, you know what? You can be faithful to going to church every Sunday, and the devil can, can come in and start to control your desires. And he can put things in your life that aren't even, you would look at them and say, well, that's not a sinful thing for a person to have or to, to be involved with. That's not sinful. But you know what happens? All these desires start to occupy our time. And before you know it, you don't have time to do anything that God really wants you to do. And that's kind of where we found ourselves. We were in church, but you know what? It, it started getting so marginalized because we had to, you know, we had to get that big house. We had to work some more overtime uh, to get the next promotion, and it just kept going on and on. 
And this accumulation of things started to happen, and our time for God just started to shrink and to shrink. Our desires were on worldly things. Mm-hmm. And you can be in church, and you can be faithful, and your desires can be far from what God wants them to be. Yeah. Are your desires ordered by the Lord? God has a desire for your life. God has put you on this earth for a purpose. He has something that he wants you to do. I like to tell my kids, we have three girls, Lucy, Alina, and Ellie. God only made one Lucy Beeman. There's only one in the world. He didn't need to make two. He has something that he wants her to do. Right. And he's made her for that. Amen. And the same thing for you. God didn't make two of you. He made one of you. There's Amen. someone that God wants you to reach. There's something that God desires of your life. And he created you to do that. Yeah. And we need to take that personal that personal responsibility seriously. Yeah. God has a desire for our life. Right. Are those your desires? Um, if God were to... Uh, we pastor talked about the heart and how we're to search, search God with all of our heart, we'll find Him. But I, I found that if you were, if we could all be honest and create a list of our top five or top ten desires, that would give us a pretty good indication of where our heart's at. Mm-hmm. Your, are your desires our window into your heart? So I ask you tonight: Are your desires ordered by the Lord? Mm-hmm. There's a verse here, Psalm chapter 37. We'll start reading here, and. God showed me a, a promise, a promise in his word that he would give you the desires of your heart. Let's start reading verse uh, number one. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell on the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. I always wondered growing up, how, did the, how does a missionary know where God has called them to go? Is there, did they see some writing on the wall? Was there a burning bush? Uh, I'm always interested to hear from other missionaries how God called them to the field. And, uh, and I was always a little bit skeptical myself. How can I know? Uh, we started going to the Philippines, and I saw the need right away. Uh, there's no mistaking it. Uh, you get to the Philippines, it's a third world country, very densely populated. We we got out of the plane, and I like to describe the Philippines. If you've ever, um, if you've ever cooked cookies in the oven or baked anything, you have to preheat it to 350 degrees. And then once that little light goes off, you open the door and you put the cookies in, and that wave of heat just hits you in the face. That's kind of like what it's like getting out of the airport in Manila. And we got out, and my senses were just completely overwhelmed. And in the Philippines, they drive these diesel cars there, and the smell just kind of permeates the air. And uh, there's so many people densely, densely populated. In the city of Manila, there's over one million homeless children. Wow. They're everywhere. It's, it's a serious problem. And I saw the need right away. I remember thinking, man, I'm really glad there's missionaries going to the Philippines. Because they really need them here. But you know what, in the back of my mind, I wanted, I wanted to be used for those couple of weeks. But then I wanted to get back to the States. I wanted my comfort back. I know where uh, I can get the things that make me feel good. And I kind of wanted to live a risk-free Christian life, where I could be in church, be faithful. Everyone looked at us, and wow, they're doing something, they're doing, um, so faithful to church. But God was calling us to the Philippines. God started to change my desires. We have plenty of desires. When I even talk to my wife about this sometimes in the car, what happened to all those desires? God started to change them. And he changed them. All those things that we thought were so important, I remember... We were at the, the private beach by our house, and we drove past someone's driveway, and they had a, a jet ski in the driveway. I thought, you know what? That's the next thing I need. Maybe we don't have a jet ski. That's what we need. And I remember the Holy Spirit just speaking to me so clearly. Tom, how many more things do I have to give you before you'll just do what I want to wow. do? Wow. So convicted by that. You know, we, we live in a prosperous nation, and we have to apologize for that. Um, we, we get up and go to work, and, and that's a great thing. But just know this, that comes with great responsibility. God wants us to do something with that for him, for his glory. Maybe God would call someone here to go to a foreign mission field. I don't know. Yeah. But those things, all those things that we have, the accumulation of things, the house, uh, the, the, the good paychecks coming in, that was kind of just wearing on us. God, you want us to go to the Philippines, but what about all these things? Can we really give all this stuff up? God, if you want us to go to the Philippines, if that's your desire for our life, God, how can we know? God showed me this verse in Psalm 37.4. Let's read this verse. 
Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. God started giving me this desire. He did the same thing with my wife. There's, a, there's two types of promises in the Bible. Um, there are unconditional promises, and then there are conditional promises. Um, what we have here in Psalm 37, 4 is a conditional promise. And I, I want to look at one unconditional promise uh, just so that we can compare the two. Um, the Bible, many of you know this, but in, in Genesis, God gives us a um, gives us one of the first uh, unconditional promises given to Noah in Genesis 9, 11. Uh, I'll just read the verse for sake of time. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. So here we have an unconditional promise from God. God said, I'm never going to flood the earth again. It's unconditional. There's nothing that we have to do in order for God to keep that promise. Then there are times in the Bible where God can give us conditions. Something that has to be met in order for God to give the promise. Psalm 37, 4. Let's read this together again. Delight thyself also in the Lord. So in the first part of the verse here, we have the condition. Here's a condition that has to be met. The second part of the verse is what we would all want. I think we could all say honestly, yes, Lord, I would like to know exactly what your desire is for my life. God has a desire for you. When you start to delight in the Lord, God's desire will become your desire. Yeah. If God wanted you to go to the, the Philippines 8,000 miles away, God could give you that desire. And that's what he started to do for us. And uh, the, the result of that promise, all those other things that we thought were so important, God started to change those desires slowly. That's how it happened. So I want to focus the rest of the time here on what does it mean to delight thyself in the Lord? We, we would all say, yes, yes, Lord. If you want me to, whatever you want me to do, God, even if it's right here, if it's uh, foreign missions, if you want me to support more missionaries, God, whatever that is, whatever your desire is for me, yes, Lord, I, I want to do that. You need to delight yourself in the Lord. We're going to look at three things quickly, and then uh, and then we'll be finished. Uh, number one, I think to delight yourself in the Lord, you have to evaluate your relationship with God. Yes. Psalm 139.23 says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I think to delight in the Lord, we have to first evaluate our relationship with God. How are things with you and God? Uh, I remember... I got the courage finally to, to call my wife, uh, to call this girl that I liked in class, and I was just completely shy and backwards with girls. I had no game at all, if I could say it that way. I finally got the courage, called her on the dorm phones, and remember dialing the number, and I was getting advice from my roommates. You know, what do I see to this girl? She's so beautiful. I really don't think I can do this, and uh, I, I just, I can't do this. And then I, I hung up the phone. Little did I know I was leaving her a voicemail, and uh, it was extremely embarrassing. And, uh, it was for me. and I called back, and I left another voicemail trying to play it off like that didn't just happen. Um, but I remember going on that first date, my dad gave me some advice. He said, Tom, just ask her a bunch of questions. That's what you need to do. Keep the conversation going. I took that advice very literally, and uh, started running down questions. And we got to get into that date. And started asking her questions, and uh, more and more and more questions, and it turned into an interrogation. Uh, it wasn't much of a date, but uh, the conversation kept going. But I wanted to know her more. I wanted to get to know her. I wanted to know everything about her. I learned that uh, my wife, she likes Snickers, but she doesn't like the, the fun size. She likes the mini size. You guys know the difference? Uh -uh. Apparently, they taste differently. And uh, I think all the things that uh, she didn't like. My wife doesn't like spiders and uh, snails in her shoes, so pray for us as we go to the Philippines. And, uh, uh, I wanted to get to know her more. How's your relationship with God? Yeah. You know, when we go to the Bible and we read His Word, uh, we should go in with the attitude, God, I want to know you more. Yeah. God, please, my relationship with, with you is here. I know this much about you. God, I want more. I want to grow my relationship with you. How's your relationship with God? First, I think we need to evaluate our relationship with God. Secondly, I think we need to be willing to do whatever God would ask us to do. So Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. We started going to the Philippines in 2011. We were at the end of the trip. We saw all the things that God was doing, the people getting saved. The Philippines is extremely open to the gospel. People just listen. We were able to go to the public schools, and God did all that. He was opening our eyes to that. We were at the end of the trip. And my wife and I, we were on the island of Buswanga. I remember looking at her and 
just had a real short conversation. Man, I kind of want to sit over here. Will we go? And you had to make that decision. Yes, we're willing. We're, we're willing to go. I think the, the delight in the Lord to receive this promise that God will give you the desires of your heart, yeah. you're going to have to be willing. Whatever God would desire for you to do, you have to be willing to do it. You have to have that spirit. And uh, after 2011, we said, yes, Lord, we're willing. But we just weren't sure. I'll just be honest with you. Maybe it was my lack of faith. I don't know. Uh, but, God, I don't know if this is what you want us to do. 2016, a national pastor talked to me in the Philippines, and he said, Tom, you've been coming to the Philippines all these years now. You're obviously burdened for the people. Why don't you pray about coming here full-time as a missionary? Mm -hmm. We need help here. Uh, man, why does he have to say that? Uh, <laughs> you've already come every two years. It's very expensive to come. Like, isn't that good enough for you? But God was speaking to me uh, through that national pastor. And uh, we got back to the States, and right. we prayed about it a little bit. And then, uh, then we just waited. Lastly, to delight yourself in the Lord. I think sometimes you're just going to have to wait. You might say, Brother Tom, I think I am delighting in the Lord. I think my relationship with God is where it should be. I, I believe I am willing to do whatever God would ask me to do. And then uh, lastly, sometimes you're just going to have to wait. Can you wait on the Lord? Psalm 27, 14 says this. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. In 2016, we started to wait. We just waited, and slowly God started to strengthen that desire. We wanted to get to the Philippines so badly. And uh, we, we surrendered to the call in 2019. It was just a short conversation after my wife and I left church on a Sunday morning. I looked at her in the car, and we started talking about the Philippines. It was the only thing that we were talking about at that time. And uh, my wife said something like, we're going to the Philippines, aren't we, Tom? Said, yeah, we're going. God has changed our desire. God has a desire for your life. God will give you that desire, but you need to delight in him. Are you delighting in the Lord? Sometimes you're just going to have to wait. We, we talked to my parents and uh, my pastor about going to the Philippines. And you know what? I, I worked in IT and I worked remotely. And we thought, let's just go to the Philippines right now. We will skip this whole deputation thing. We don't need to go on that. We don't need to do any of that. And uh, God made it very clear. Tom, you need to wait. You're not ready just yet. Tom, you're going you're gonna to come to the First Baptist Church and uh, you're going to meet some people and they're going to pray for you. You need to wait, Tom. You know what's happened as we've waited? God has strengthened our heart. And God will do that for you, too. Um, let's pray. And then everybody, we go. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for being so good to us, Lord. Uh, I pray that we would all delight in you, Lord, that you would give us the desires of our heart, Lord, help us to put away those other desires that, that shouldn't be there. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Did you, did you keep your head bowed and your eyes closed for just a second? I want to make sure, first and foremost, that if there is anyone at all that hasn't received Christ, you're not sure you're going to heaven, that you tonight are given that opportunity. So if you are sitting there thinking, man, you know, I, I may have received him in sort of a way, but I don't know if I'm really going to heaven. I don't really know. Slip your hand up if that's you. Go ahead and do it without fear. Go ahead. Anybody? Okay. Christians, why don't you stand? Christian, stand to your feet. Clifford Clark, dear friend of ours uh, in the family, is past now, I believe, had a quote that he used to say an awful lot, and I appreciated that. He'd say, not everyone's called to the foreign mission field, but everyone should struggle with the possibility. So the poignant question is, have you ever struggled? So I could never go. I'm 70 years old. You know something, my friends? Plenty of 70 and 80 year old people have gone to the mission. Amen. Amen. We're not at all exempt just because we're a little older. If the Holy Spirit's touching your heart, and let's say he's not, and you've never let him, well, what difference would it make if he did? If you're not willing. If tonight you'd say, you know what, I'm going to get down on my knees to front here, and I'm just going to say, Lord, I'm willing. That's all I'm going to say, Lord, I'm willing. If you'd be willing to do just that, just to come and say, Lord, even if it's just for a few days or a month or six months or whatever you want, I'm willing to do it if you'll make it clear to me to go. If that would be your desire, and you'd say, you know what, I'll do that. I'll come and I'll kneel and I'll give him that much prayer. Go ahead.
That's right. Good. Go ahead. That's the way. Come. Yeah. Come right now. Just come on down. There's not going to be any music or any of that. Just come down. You say, I'd be willing to do that. I'm not going to be selfish with my life. I'm going to let God decide. Lord, if you want me, if you want me on the foreign mission field, I'll go. You say, well, can I do that here in the people? Well, sure you can. But, you know, friends, sometimes it's just a nice thing to get on a knee or, or to sit down and make that commitment in your heart. Lord,